This is Josh White with JW Math Tutoring. Today's video is going to go over the digital SAT practice test number three, the math section module 2B, or the harder of the uh, two second modules on this specific test. So let's go ahead and jump right in. But life is a dream the calculus could never predict. All right, just getting ready to start um, the module 2B, the harder of the second uh, math module for practice test three from the Blue Book app. I have it loaded here inside uh, the Blue Book app. Uh, two things to keep in mind. First, the uh, a lot of time to complete this test will most likely be longer than the 35 minutes that uh, you're typically allowed. That's because I could show as many ways as possible to solve uh, some of these problems. Second, uh, if you like this video, of course, please do give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel, sign up for notifications as well. So let's go ahead, get started. All right, so here are question number one. Uh, you're just given the equation of a line and basically just wants to know for your answer choices here, uh, which of these points, you know, basically are on this line, satisfy this equation. So there's multiple ways you could do this one. I mean, if you just notice uh, off the bat, if you plug in zero for X, you know, zero plus four is just going to be four. So right off the bat, A is a possibility. Uh, B is going to be eliminated. C is going to be eliminated. And now what I would also do here, you can, uh, let's see, zoom out. It is not letting me zoom in and out. All right, so I guess we'll just have to scroll down. And if you look at D, it is uh, zero zero, which does not um, which is not on the line. So just by checking basically one point, we can go ahead and we can determine that the correct answer for this is going to be A. You could also, as well, I mean, you could graph the line and in uh, Desmos, and then you could go look on and see which of these points, you know, <clears throat> that are listed here are also found um, on the line. But you don't really need to do that for this one because, you know, hopefully you notice the y-intercept is four and A is the only one, uh, you know, that basically has that point. All right, next question number two. Uh, here we have a basic geometry question with some parallel lines. So, if you notice here, basically um, the value for x in this is going to be um, 147. Correct answer is going to be letter D. And the whole reason is because, if you look at this graph here, basically you could either determine that x and this angle are corresponding angles, therefore they'll have the same measure. And so really X and 33 are supplementary angles, you know, or two adjacent angles that form a straight line. So, you know, they just add up to 180. And you could just then solve for X and get the 147. Or you could also look at it and say 33 and this angle here are corresponding angles, therefore they're the same. And now you can do the same exact equation. X plus 33 equals 180. So however you want to look at it, correct answer is letter D, uh, 147. All right, next up, uh, question number three, we have percentages. So on this one, all we're doing is basically just dividing 75 by 300. You know, so what percentage of 300 is 75? So if you want to translate that into an equation, you'll basically be like, what percentage X of multiplication 300 is equal sign 75. So when you go to solve this, you know, you just divide by 300 on both sides. So the correct answer for this one is going to be letter A. You divide 75 over 300 on a calculator, you're going to get 0.25, which of course corresponds to uh, 25%. All right, here we have uh, question number four. First, uh, student produced response question. So this one is relatively uh, simple. Just wants to know for what value of x is this function equal to 54. So the traditional way would be just to set 6x equal to 54. And if you do that and you solve for x, you will get the value of 9. 
So the correct answer here will be nine. Just to show you real quick, you can, you know, you can solve this equation in Desmos. You can solve linear equations. You can also solve other types of equations. All we have to do is just graph basically the left side and the right side. This, I like to do it this way rather than just typing in 6x six, 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 six equals 54. I'll, show you, I'll tell you why in a second. Um, but if you do this, you will have to zoom out. And then you see where do those lines intersect? The intersection point, the x coordinate of it will be the solution, which is 9. Now, you could technically have also just typed in the whole thing, 6x equals 54. And then you can see there's a vertical line here. And we know that it's at 9 because we click on the x-intercept. So that is a way to get it. I don't like doing that, though. Uh, for solving linear equations because, or it doesn't have to be linear, it could be others as well. If it's no solution or infinite solutions, you don't see anything on the graph if you do it this way. So you don't know which case it is exactly. Whereas if you do it the other way, where you put both equations, if it's no solution, you'll see it's two parallel lines. In any case, correct answer is nine. We can move on to the next question. All right. Here we have just a basic function evaluation question. So you're just plugging in zero uh, for x and it's evaluating that. So it's just gonna be 270 times 0.1 to the zero power. Well, anything to the zero power is just one. So the correct answer for this is just going to be letter D 270. And again, you could just do this in Desmos as well. You can literally type the function and I'll show you this. This is uh, something useful. You could literally just type the function and then in the next line, just type f of zero. And it gives you the answer here. You know, don't need to do any more work. Okay. All right, next up, question number six. Here we have a geometry uh, related question where you. Uh, you know, basically have a right triangle. So you're told that um, two of the angles in this add up to 90 degrees. All right, and then you're also told a value of a trigonometric function. So the fact that R and S add up to 90, what that means is if you draw the picture, R and S have to be the two acute angles and T has to be the right angle. So now, when you go to do sine r, which is opposite over adjacent, so here's angle r, opposite side would be root 15, excuse me, not opposite, opposite over hypotenuse, excuse me, for sine, SOHCAHTOA, S-O-H. Um, and the hypotenuse uh, would be 4. So now if you go to do cosine s, well, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So cosine of s would be the adjacent side, which is also root 15 over the hypotenuse, which is 4. So the correct answer for this is letter B. But you technically don't have to draw the triangle if you know the properties of sine and cosine. And specifically, the property is that, like, if you have two complementary angles, which we do here, r and s, the sine of r is always going to be equal to the cosine of s, and, and the opposite would be true, too sine s is equal to cosine of r. So if you know that property, you would know right away the answer is just going to also be root 15 over 4. But if you didn't, you could draw the triangle like I did initially and then um, go from there. Also, just so you know, another way you could technically get this, and this would be like whatever, a lot more work, but if you're having trouble drawing the triangle, um, you could figure out the measure of angle r so, you know, we go to the Desmos calculator, and the way you do that is you do inverse sine. So, for example, let me see here. Let me see if it'll give me, uh, it's just by typing it. So, we got root 15. Okay. So this technically is in radians, but that's fine. I'm just going to switch degrees. So I'll just hit the wrench arrow, switch to degrees. Okay. So we know that the angle R is this many degrees, 75.52, blah, 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 blah. Now, S is going to be 90 minus that. So 5, 2, 2, 4, 8, 7, 8, 1, 4, 1. Okay. So that's the measure of angle S. 
So what's the cosine of angle S? 14.4775125859. Okay. This right here is what the cosine of angle S is equal to. So we're looking for an answer that is 0.968245. So when you look at the answer choices, then you would eliminate these down to see which one is equal to that. So for example, square root of 15 divided by 15. Is that equal to it? No. Nope. Root 15 over 4. Yes, it's close enough. It doesn't match exactly because I had to round, you know, when I was typing in these angles. But this is an alternate approach you could use on this one if, for whatever reason, you didn't remember the properties of a sine and cosine or you're having difficulty, um, you know, getting a triangle set up and figured out from that. All right, here we have an exponential function, um, and they just want to know what the y-intercept of this is. So the traditional way would be just to plug in uh, 0 for x. So you got negative 8 times 2 to the 0 plus 22. A lot of people think, assume it's going to be 22 because they think of uh, lines, and you know the number out at the end is the y-intercept. That is not the case here because um, 2 to the 0 will be 1. Negative 8 times 1 will be negative 8, so negative 8 plus 22 is going to give us 14. Correct answer is going to be letter A, 0, 14. However, you could easily do this question in Desmos. So all we have to do is just graph the function. And the y-intercept is just highlighted right here as a gray dot, just like the x-intercept is as well. So right here, what's the y-intercept? Oh, 0, 14. There it is, answer choice A. You know, move on to the next question. All right, so for 8, um, this problem, what you're supposed to do is uh, get a common denominator <clears throat> uh, between the two fractions and combine them and then you know, go ahead and combine the like terms on the top and so on and so forth. I will do that in a second, but first I'm going to show you a much quicker, easier, faster way to do this in Desmos. Basically, what I'm doing is I'm going to match expressions. So I'm going to graph the first expression uh, that's given by just setting it um, equal to y. Okay, so I just do y equals uh, this whole expression here. Now, I'm going to run through the answer choices. I'm going to do y equals, and I'm looking for which of these matches identically the graph that I already have on the screen. In other words, which one overlaps it completely is what I'm looking for. So answer choice A is obviously not it. Okay, let me move on to answer choice B. 3 over 3x minus 6. Clearly not it. Um, let's move on to C. Need a negative out front here. And I need a 4x minus 5. Okay, this one does not overlap. It looks like it's going to be D by process of elimination, but let's just confirm. <clears throat> x plus 1. Yep, yeah, 4x plus 5. Okay, so notice... I only see one graph on the screen. That's because they're entirely overlapping each other. The way I can do that is, if notice if I turn this off, I have the same graph. Turn it on, nothing changes. Turn this off, again, nothing changes. Same as that thing. You could zoom out too if you want a bigger view, but that is confirmation that answer uh, letter D is the correct answer to this problem. Again, in Desmos, I just matched two uh, expressions to be equivalent to each other. Now, here's how you actually do this one out by hand. So what you would do is the first uh, rational expression is going to be multiplied by x plus 1, because we're going to need that to make a common denominator. So it's actually, it's sorry, x plus 1 over itself. And then the second one needs the 4x minus 5. So we're going to multiply by that over itself. So now everything's going to be over a common denominator of x plus 1 times 4x minus 5. In, in the front, you have 4x plus 4. And then here we have 4x plus 5. 
excuse me, 4x minus 5, just when I multiply by the 1. But this whole thing is behind a minus sign. So it's really like if I made a giant bracket here, when I apply the subtraction sign, it's now going to become minus 4x and then plus 5. So the 4x's cancel out, and 4 plus 5 gives you 9 on top. And of course, it's over the x plus 1 times 4x minus 5. So that just confirms correct answer uh, is letter D if you do it out, you know, by hand. Okay, number 9 here, we have uh, another student-produced response. So you have this graph and this function, excuse me. And then you have another function, which is basically just this original function translated up four units. You know, what's the value of the new function at zero? So two different ways you could do this. First, I will show you the quick and easy way to do it in Desmos. So all we have to do is enter in the first function. Then we define the new function g of x as the original function and now shift it up four units means we add four but it is outside the parentheses so now i have the new function defined so now in the next line i can just say well what's g of zero? Oh, 76 and that is the correct answer so correct answer is 76 you can solve this entire problem in desmos without doing any work but if you wanted to do it by hand or you wanted another way to double check it, what I would do is I would basically plug in zero here for x and you're going to get negative six times negative two times positive six. When you multiply that all out, it's 72. And then you have to shift it up four units, which means you have to add four to it. And that equals 76, which matches the answer I got doing it in Desmos. So however you do it, correct answer for this one is 76. All right, next up for number 10, we have a cube. They tell us it's volume and they want to know the surface area of it. So a couple things. Since it's a cube, that means all of the sides you know, have the same length. So it's kind of like, you know, if you draw the picture here, you know, length and width and height, they're all x. So to get the volume, it's just like x times x times x, or it's basically x cubed equals, you know, this gigantic number. So really you take the cube root of this number and that is going to be how long each side is. If you do that, it comes out to 78. Now, if you think about it for a cube, it basically has six faces, like front and back, left and right, top and bottom. The area of each face will be the same. It's just going to be x squared because basically all the sides in the cube, all the faces, they're all squares. So the area of one face is x squared, but the total surface area is then just going to be 6 times x squared. So you just do 6 times 78 squared. If you do that out on a calculator, it's going to come out to 36,504. So the answer you would write in here is 36,504. And then you can go ahead, you know, move on uh, to the next question. All right, here we have a question now which deals with um, percentages. So for this function, um, the value of q of x, i.e. the y, decreases by 45% for every increase in x by 1. The uh, When x is 0, y or q of x is 14, and they want to know what the equation is. So basically, uh, this is just a standard kind of exponential function. And there's multiple ways uh, that you could get this. So the first way is, if you know the theory behind exponential functions, how they're set up and everything, basically a 45% decrease means that um, when you have your exponential function, which usually looks something like this, um, this r value in here is going to be 0.45. And we're going to be subtracting it from 1 because it's a decrease. So the actual number that you multiply by, which corresponds to a 45% decrease, is 0.55. All right. 
So that's the number that has to be inside the parentheses. That eliminates basically everything except C, which is the correct answer here. Also, the A here, the number in front, that is the initial or starting amount, which is uh, this value right here. So um, the correct answer you know, for this one is going to be letter C. Now, uh, there is an alternate way that you could, let me just clear the screen here. There's an alternate way that you could figure um, this one out as well. So what we could do is um, we could pick some numbers and uh, plug them in and see which value corresponds <clears throat> Um, plug them in the answer choice to see which one corresponds to what we get. So for example, I know here, first of all, they tell you that you're starting at 14, okay? So that means when X is one, it's going to be whatever 14 minus, you know, 45% of 14 is. So if we just go to Desmos, all right, so we got 14 and we're subtracting 45% of 14, okay? So that means when x is one, we should get 7.7 7 as our, you know, as our value that corresponds to it. So now you just run through the answer choices and you plug in one and you see which of these equals 7.7. 7. Now, the problem is it looks like it's going, there are going to be uh, technically two of them that work. A technically works. B does not work. Obviously, C will work because we already, you know, we already know it's correct. Um, and then if you try D, so you get to the one. Okay, D is not going to work. All right, so two of them give us seven point seven. So then, what you would have to do is you technically would have to pick another. Um, thing to test it out with, so maybe x equals 2. So you could do like, okay, now we're at 7.7, .7, we subtract another 45% of it, and we get 4.235. So now when I plug in 2, which of these is equal to 4.235? Well, it's obviously C, we already know that's the correct answer, and now we can just confirm it, you know, when we look at uh, what we get here. So again, that's an alternate method. That's basically the idea of picking numbers. I pick a number for x, I work it out by hand, I see what I get for my y value, and then I plug that x value into the answer choices, and I see which gives the same y value that I got when I worked it out by hand. All right, next question, uh, number 12. Here they give us a single linear inequality, and they want to know basically which set of points um, our solutions to this inequality. So there's multiple ways uh, that you could do this. First of all, I am going to uh, zoom out just so I can see all the answer choices on the screen at one time and not have to bother scrolling, you know, going up and down uh, constantly. So first way you could do this is you can basically take some of the points, take like one of the X values, plug it in, see uh, what the Y is and if it works, so, <clears throat> for example, if you start with, say, 3, because they all have an x uh, value of 3 as, like, the first point. So, I plug in 3 for x. I've got 6 times 3 plus 2. All right, that is 18 plus 2, or in other words, that is 20. So, my y value has to be basically less than 20. So I can eliminate A because 20 is not less than 20. I can eliminate D because 24 is not less than 20. Now you can move on to choosing between B and C. So let's say I pick 5 and plug that in. So we've got 6 times 5 plus 2. That's 30 plus 2. So my Y value has to be less than 32. Uh, that is not true for B. However, it is true for C. 28 is less than 32. Okay, so that's one way you could do it. You could also uh, do this in Desmos as well. So just to show you how you could do that, let's first jump back to the normal zoom level. Okay, so I could bring up the calculator and I could just graph this inequality. Okay, now what I'm going to do is 
I'm just going to graph some of the, so I'm going to start with A and I'm going to graph 320. Okay. Is that point in the shaded area? Uh, the answer is no. And notice it's specifically, this point is on the border, but since it's less than, that means the border points are not part of the solution. Okay. That's why it's a dashed line. So this point is not in the solution. Then you could move on to B. And if you, for example, wanted to just do 316, okay, that's in there. So B and C check so far. And then for D, okay, we already saw 320 doesn't work, so we can get rid of 324. So now you could just type 536. Let's say you wanted to check B. Okay, so there's 536. Is it in the shaded area? Is it part of the solution set? No, it is not. Therefore, it's not going to be B, so process of elimination tells us it's C. But you could also just type the point 528. There it is. It is in the solution. That's how you could solve this problem entirely, uh, just using Desmos. All right, next up, question number 13. They're asking for some factors of this expression. Um, so <clears throat> a couple of different ways you could do this. Um, you could, first of all, just go ahead, take the expression, factor it, and I'm able to tell you it's going to be, we know it's going to be 3x and x, and we know the factors are going to be uh, something of 63. It's going to be minus 7 and plus 9. So, and you could foil, we could foil this out and just confirm that when you do this, you do end up with the original expression. So this is how it factors. So now when you look at this, this is not uh, a factor, this is a factor, so the correct answer for this is letter B. Now, here are two other ways that you could do this. So you could technically um, also do this using synthetic division. Um, <clears throat> what you'd have to do, I mean, so to check the first one, you know, basically you're just gonna go like this, and then we're gonna drop the three down, and then we get 27. And then as we go down, we get 47. Nine times 47 is some gigantic number. It is not equal to positive 63. So the number you get here for the remainder is not zero. That tells us that it is not a factor. Now for the second one, technically you'd have to divide it by three and you'd have to look at X minus uh, seven thirds when you go ahead and do the synthetic division. Now, the other way to do this is just go to Desmos, graph out the expression, look at the zeros, i.e. the x-intercepts, and basically see if those okay, um, correspond to the given factors. So for example, here is an x-intercept of negative 9. Okay, so that will correspond to a factor of x plus 9. So again, the actual x-intercept, the actual zero, the root, is negative 9, and it corresponds to a factor of x plus 9. The reason why is because, if you think about it, if x equals negative 9, if you just rearrange this and get it so that the uh, it's equal to 0, you know, you add 9 to both sides, x plus 9 equals 0. You know, that's what we do when we factor, right, when we solve this, if you set it equal to 0, you would factor it, and then you set each factor equal to 0 and solve for x. Kind of the opposite of what I uh, just did here. So um, we can see that the first one is not going to apply. And now if you look at the second one here, it's 2.333. Okay, so what I probably have to do is I would, I would type this just a bunch of times. Um, it's not going to give me... There we go. Eventually, once you type enough threes, uh, it'll tell us that it's equal to seven thirds. That's what I was looking for. So if you know that the factor is equal to seven thirds, excuse me, if you know that the x-intercept is equal to seven thirds, then you would get x minus seven thirds equals zero. And then you could technically multiply by everything by three on both sides, and that would turn it into three x minus seven equals zero. Okay, that one checks, that one matches. This is basically how you can factor um, uh, also a an expression just by graphing it and getting its x-intercepts. So this just confirms we get the same factoring I did originally. X plus 9 times 3x minus 7. So again, it's only it's two only correct answers, letter B. Um, that's how you could do it. 
you know, pretty much entirely in Desmos. Next question, number 14. Here we have a system of linear equations, and they want to, it tells that h is a constant, and it says if it has no solution, you know, what is the value of h? So, first I'll show you how to do this in Desmos, because that is a much quicker, easier way to do it. Then after that, I'll show you how to do it uh, kind of by hand, or in other words, how to double check it. So I'm going to go to Desmos, and I'm going to graph out the first line. I am just going to type it in as written. And then I'm going to graph the second line. And I'm going to add a slider for h. And now all I have to do is check these four values. One of them is going to give us no solution, which means the two lines will be parallel. Same slope, but different intercepts. So let's first check negative 9. Nope. Clearly not parallel, they intersect once. Let's check zero. Nope, that's just gonna be a vertical line obviously because then it'd just be x equals a number. Let's check positive nine. Nope, they still intersect. So by process of elimination, it's going to be D, but just to confirm, we'll just change the step up here, you know, whatever, to 20. We'll go up here to 18. And now you can see we have two nice parallel lines, same slope, different y-intercepts. So the correct answer you know, for this is just going to be letter D. Now, here's how you could check it. Here's how you could do it not in Desmos. So basically, I mean, there's two ways you could look at this. Uh, one way to look at this would be to um, get both lines in slope-intercept form. So on the top one, I'm going to get 4x minus 5 equal to 18y, just by moving the negative 9y over to the right, and then divide by 18. Okay, so for the top one, the slope turns out to be 4 over 18, which is 2 over 9. And so that's the same slope we're looking for in the bottom one. So take the bottom one, um, just divide by h to get y alone. I'm going to move the 4x out front, and then we get plus 2 over h. So what I need is the same slope. In other words, I need 2 over 9 to equal 4 over h. Okay, in order for those two slopes to equal. So this is going to be true when h is 18. If you just notice, 2 times, you know, 2 is going to make 4, so 9 times 2 would have to equal 18. Um, but you could also cross multiply and solve it, and you get 2h equals 36, and then h equals 18. So that's one method to do it. You could also uh, put both of them into standard form and then look for the multipliers, um, comparing the x's and the y's, and basically they have to be the same for it to be no solution. And that would lead you to um, positive 18 as well. But much quicker and easier just to solve this one in Desmos. All right, next up we have a student-produced response um, for question number 15 here. So uh, for this problem, we have an absolute value equation. And we can also uh, just solve this problem in Desmos as well. So if we just bring up the calculator, and what I'm going to do, again, the approach I like to do is graph the left side, then graph the right side, All right, so that's the left side, and now we can graph the right side. Basically, we're looking to see where the two graphs intersect. Those are going to be our solutions. So there's one here at negative 1, uh, but we want the positive solution. So where's the positive solution? Well, it's just 9. So, you know, that's it. Correct answer is going to be 9, and you could, you know, basically do that and move on. Now, I will show you how to do this by hand in case you wanted to, you know, double check this or just, you know, felt like doing it out. So first thing you could do is you can technically combine these together and turn this into 5 times absolute value 4 minus x equals 25. Then you can divide by 5. And then once you have this, 
Now you can set up the two equations. First one looks like the original problem, no absolute value signs. Second one looks like uh, the original problem, but you have to make the right side opposite, or in this case equal to negative five. So if you go and try to solve this um, now, the left side's gonna give you the negative value. It's gonna be negative x equals one or x equals negative one. The right side is actually going to give you the positive value that you want, x equals nine. So that is the correct answer. And again, that's how you could get this um, by hand, you know, just working the problem out. All right, next up, 16, another uh, student produced response question. So this one, um, basically we're gonna set up an inequality with these large candles, candle prices and uh, small candle prices. And basically we wanna know the maximum amount of, or maximum number of the large candles that can be purchased to basically stay within the budget, but also maintain the discounted pricing. So really what you're doing here is you're setting up two different inequalities and I'll show you them and then I'll show you the easy way to get the answer um, in Desmos. So the first one is just going to be basically x plus y is greater than or equal to 200. So number of small candles plus number of large candles together has to be a minimum of 200 to maintain discounted pricing. That's where this first inequality comes from. The second one is gonna be the cost. And so that's just gonna be like 4.9x plus 11.60y is now less than or equal to 2200, okay? because that's the total amount of money it needs to spend and it has to stay under budget. Now, it says, what's the maximum number of large candles? So the easiest way to see this or to find this is uh, to go ahead and graph them out because this will help visualize it. I don't say anything yet, but I will zoom out um, to show you what it looks like. Okay, so let's zoom out and see what's going on here. So the solutions are the basically where the two shadings overlap. So this triangle right here, okay, these are all of the solutions to um, this system of linear inequalities. And if you notice, it says, okay, what's the maximum number of large candles? Well, the large candles are the Y coordinate, the Y value, because that's what's multiplied by 1160. So of all the points inside this shaded region, which one has the highest Y value? Well, it's going to be this point up here right at the intersection um, at the very top. So if we clear the screen here, notice you can click on it right here, 182.09. Now, obviously you can't buy fractions of a candle, so the actual number um, that you're gonna put down as your answer is just gonna be 182. That's the maximum number of large candles that this person can buy such that they'll spend less than $2,200 but also be able to purchase enough small candles to have a total of uh, 200 uh, minimum. And so basically what you would end up doing is it would really be 182 large and then this 17.91 technically gets rounded up to 18. 182 plus 18 is 200 total. So you meet that, um, you meet that criteria. And the way you could actually solve this out by hand if you didn't graph it over here is you would technically set up the inequality and solve, or excuse me, a system of equations and solve it. And if you do this, you know, you get, you solve and get the intersection point, you're gonna get like, again, the y, y is 182.09. But it's much easier to see visually when you graph them out. That's how you tell, or that's the easy way for me to identify that the maximum Y value, maximum number of large candles occurs at the intersection point um, itself. All right, next up, question number 17, we have an exponential function. Um, so for this problem, 
Uh, they want to know the value. To, oh, what the value of P is um, as a percentage if the, you know the value of the equipment is decreasing by P percent each year. So this one uh, looks complicated, but it's actually not. So if you remember kind of the general form for an exponential function, I like to write it kind of like this. It's like a initial value in front and then times one plus or minus r to the, say the, the you know, the x, the exponent. So here, r is like your rate of growth or your rate of decrease or decline. So basically like the p value here is like the r. In other words, 0.64, which is the numbers at the parentheses is equal to one minus some r value, okay? And that r value is the basically the rate of decrease each year, or technically here, it's I mean, I'll just use p because that's what they're asking for. So if you go ahead and solve, just kind of rearrange this and solve this, you know, you get negative 0.36 equals negative p, p equals 0.36. So the answer to this is just letter c, 0.36, okay? Um, so that's it. It's like, you know, if something is decreasing by 36% every year, that is the same in an exponential function as multiplying by one minus that or multiplying by 0.64, you know, every year. Okay. Now, if you got confused by that, or if you didn't quite follow that, that's fine. There's an alternate way you could solve this. And it's basically, um, picking numbers. So, what I would do is I would say, okay, let's let x equal zero. And then since it says it decreases by each, by P percent each year. So then I need to let x equal 12 because 12 X represents the number of months. So 12 months is equivalent to one year. You plug in zero for X, you plug in 12 for X, you get those two values and then you compare them to see what the percent changes to see how much it decreased by. So I'm just going to do that on, um, I'm just going to do that in Desmos, just it'll be much quicker and you can, you know, see the actual calculations work out. So there's our function. So if we start with f of 12, okay, we get that value. We get f of zero, we get that value. So it's, so now to find the percent change, and this is technically going to be a, um, uh, a negative number because we're going to do new uh, minus old divided by old or divided by original. So technically to find percent change, I would do f of 12 minus f of zero. And now I have to, there we go, divide the whole thing by the original, which is f of zero. So it's negative and that's, that's what we expect because it's a decrease or a decline, but notice it's 0.36. So what does that correspond to? Oh, 36%. So this is just an alternate way you could get the answer um, using picking numbers. All right, next up, number 18. Here we have another exponential function and they tell us that this new function is basically equal to f of x plus two, and then they want to know which of the following defines um, g. So there are multiple ways you could do this. The easiest way is obviously going to be in Desmos. So let's go to, let's go back to it. So let's define f of x. Now we'll define g of x. Okay, and now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna turn off f of x. I am now going to graph the answer choices and see which one matches g of x ident identically. So we'll make a new function. Okay, does answer choice A match? Nope, move on to answer choice B. Does that match? Uh, it looks like it. So it looks like this is the correct answer, but I'm just gonna check C and D just to be sure. Here is C, does that match? Nope. 16, 81, does that match? No. Okay, so it's the answer is clearly B. Um, so we could just mark that down and you could move on. Okay, again, 
figured it out completely um, in Desmos. However, here's the actual uh, kind of mathematical way to work this out. So, for the new function, you basically take x and you replace it with x plus 2. So if you take the original function and we replace x with x plus 2, this can be simplified to 9 times. Now, here the exponents are added. That What that means is they're really multiplied together. So 4 squared, 16. 16 times 9, 144. So this becomes now 144 times 4 to the x. Answer choice B, that's how you could get it um, alternately just by actually like working it out, you know, algebraically. You could also do uh, picking numbers on this, but I'm not going to bother um, going through it just because um, it's extra, basically the extra work, and I think it's much easier to either just do it in Desmos like I showed, or if you understand the algebra behind it, you know, just do it uh, this way as well. But you could technically use picking numbers also. All right, question number 19. We have a quadratic equation uh, here. Basically, they want to solve this, and they want an answer, which is like some simplified version of the quadratic formula. So... Essentially, what we're going to do is, um, I'm just going to go ahead, you know, do the quadratic formula. A is 1, B is negative 2, C is negative 9. So we've got opposite of B plus or minus square root B squared minus 4 times uh, A times C all over 2 times A. Now, to simplify this all out, we've got a 2 on the top, we've got a 2 on the bottom, inside negative 2 squared is 4, 9, negative 4 times 1, negative 4 times negative plus 36, so we get square root of 40. This doesn't quite match our answer because our answer has a 1 in front of the square root, and the reason is because root 40 is simplified to 2 root 10. And now all the 2s can cancel out, 2, 2, 2, we're left with 1s. So we now get x equals basically 1 plus or minus root 10. So the correct answer for this one is going to be 19. However, uh, this question could also be solved in Desmos, and here is how you could do that. So go back to Desmos, we're going to graph this equation out. We're going to look at the x-intercepts. Since this one is 1 plus the square root of a positive number, I'm only being be concerned with this one. Okay, so now all I have to do is go through the answer choice and see, okay, 1 plus, and then calculate out the answer choices. Okay, is that equal to 4.162? No. All right, let's try the next one. Is that equal to 4.162? Yes. Correct answer will then be letter B. You don't need to try C and D. So that's how you could solve this one uh, basically entirely in Desmos as well. All right, for question number 20, here we have an equation. It's technically a quadratic equation. Um, and they're asking about... Um, you know, what the smallest possible value of k is such that there is no solution to this equation. So go ahead and multiply this equation out. We get kx squared minus 56x. Now I'm going to add the 16 over to set it equal to zero. So basically what we're looking for is for no real solution, we're looking for the discriminant to be less than zero. So um, that basically means b squared minus 4ac, the part under the radical in the um, quadratic uh, formula, to be less than 0 or to be negative. So that would be negative 56 squared minus 4 and then the k times 16. And so now this just becomes 3136 minus 64k. We need this value to be less than 0. So all we need to do is just go ahead and solve this. Okay, we get negative 64k is less than 3136. You go ahead and you divide. Um, excuse me, that's going to be negative. 
and it's going to flip the sign. You're going to divide by negative 64, and you're going to get k is greater than 49. So what is the least possible value of k? It's not 49, it's 50. And we can confirm this, uh, excuse me, correct answer, 50 in Desmos. So what I would do is now, I would go over here and we can graph out. And we can just do it exactly how it's written there. So if you do 50x minus 56, Um, actually, we should do it this way here. Let me just add 16 to the left. Okay, there we go. I'm gonna, so I added 16 to the left and then just replace that with a Y. Okay, so now notice uh, there's no real solution because there are no X intercepts. However, if I change this to 49, now, there is one real solution, so this, that's why the answer is not 49. It has to be greater than 49, and because it's an integer, it has to then bump up to 50. Okay, so this is how you confirm this in Desmos. You could also technically have done this using a slider. So, for example, if you just made this K, and then if you add a slider, okay, now, so if you zoom out, you, you see that, like, right here, it's way down here. In order to get no x-intercepts, it's going to have to slide up a lot. So, but you would have to keep going, and eventually, you know, you would find that it's at 50, but it might take you, you know, a while to get there. So because it's free response, I mean, I probably wouldn't recommend that, but if you had enough time, you could do that and you could examine it, because, um, especially because it tells you it has to be an integer, so you don't have to worry about it being a decimal value. All right, next up, question number 21. Uh, this one, so there's multiple ways you could do this. The way the actual equation um, is basically set up is going to be um, the, say the f of x, the, the total amount that's charged, okay, is equal to $220 plus uh, the, the hourly fee which is more, um, which is uh, charged for more than two hours. So the problem is they don't tell you what it is exactly, but we can figure it out because if you subtract like 400 minus 220, the difference between the 220 that is charged initially and the total here was $180. You divide that by three because the first two hours are in the 220 and then the, the remaining three hours to make five, you know, cost 180. So the hourly fee is $60. So it's basically going to be 220 plus 60. Now, the 60 is not chart is not multiplied by x. It's multiplied by x minus 2 because the $60 only kicks in after 2 hours. So like here in the example we just did, you know, 60 was multiplied by 3 even though it was a total of 5 hours, it was 3 hours after the initial 2. So this is the equation you technically set up. And now if you simplify that, it becomes 60x minus 120. And it should now become 100 plus 60x, or answer choice A, 60x plus 100. That's one way you could solve this. An alternate way that you could do this is uh, you could just do basically back solving. So for example, they tell us five hours repair, $400. Go through each of these answer choices, plug in five, and see which of them gives you uh, $400 uh, for the total cost. So <clears throat> 60 times five is 300 plus 100. This one will be 400. This is going to be 300 plus five, 220, 520. You know, no. This one is, is going to be 400, and this one is uh, going to be 400 plus 220, like, 620. Okay, no. So you're down to these two choices. Hopefully you would re recognize that C is wrong because this basically just says like it's $80 times every hour, but that doesn't match up with the fact that it's 220 for two hours of repair. So now what you could do is you could just say, okay, plug in X equals two and see which one gives you 220. Well, 60 times two is 120 plus it's 220. 80 times two, 160. 
All right, well, that's obviously wrong. So it's answer choice A. So that's an alternate method you could use uh, to solve this one as well. Basically, this is back solving. I'm taking a number of hours that I know what the total cost is, plugging it into the answer choices and seeing which one gives me what the known expected you know, value is. All right, last question here, number 22 on uh, practice test three, module 2B, the harder module. So here you have a histogram, you have a um, bunch of data that's plotted out. Okay, and they wanna know the smallest possible difference between the mean of A and the mean of B. So to make the smallest possible difference, essentially what you would be doing is you would be um, taking for A the smallest value, like that's at the left of each bar, which is 20, 30, 40, 50. And then for B, you would be taking the highest possible value, which is like at the right of each bar, because that's what get the values closest together. So for example, the first one, you'd say like all the values are 19. This one, all the values are 29. This one, all 39, all 49, okay? Then you could go ahead and you could actually calculate them out and figure it out. Now the answer is going to be one because if you notice, it's like 20, 30, 40, 50 compared to 19, 29, uh, 39, 49. Like there's a difference of one between each of them. So that's the answer. But just to show you technically how you could uh, actually calculate it out um, in Desmos here. So all you have to do is we make a table. So for the first one, um, we're going to put the values, which 20, 30, 40, again, 50. We're picking the lowest that possible value for each range, for each bar, like the left value of the bar. And then the frequencies are 3, 4, 7, 9, it looks like. 3, 4, 7, 9. So I type all that in. Okay, and then I do total x1, and I multiply that. This is also how you find the um, average of data when it's in a frequency table. So I'm taking each row, for each row I'm multiplying the x column times the y column, the value times the frequency, I add them all up, and then I divide by, actually, sorry, it's one, I didn't get rid of, it's, There we go, sorry, it's the total, I want the sum or the total of uh, each individual thing multiplied, okay? So now, that's, uh, so now I'll do another one, but now they're gonna be 19, 29, 39, 49. The frequencies are the same, three, four, seven, nine. Okay, and I'm gonna do the total of x1 times y1, and divided by, okay. So, how do the means compare? First one is, oh, I, I typed, this is supposed to be x2, sorry, and y2, that's why it's the same number, because I made a new table, there we go. All right, so we've got, for data set A, 39.565217, blah, blah, blah. For data set B, 38.565217. Notice the decimals are the same. So when the difference between these is going to be one. So this is how you confirm that the answer to this question is just letter B, uh, one. Smallest possible difference between them. All right, so that was module 2B from Practice Test 3 in the Blue Book app, the harder of the two second modules um, for this test. If you have any questions or comments, uh, please do leave them below. Um, otherwise, look for uh, more videos um, going through answers to the uh, Blue Book uh, practice test. And of course, if you like this video, please do give a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Sign up for notifications as well.